Uh, I write about artificial intelligence, both fiction and non-fiction. Um, I'm fascinated by what artificial intelligence is going to do to us in the coming decades as individuals and as uh, societies. Um, I've <coughs> just finished writing a book which is out to review at the moment, uh, which covers two major issues, technological unemployment and the further out possibility that we'll create an artificial general intelligence and then super intelligence. Now, obviously, that is beyond the scope of today. The book is called Surviving AI, and I hope that gives you a sense that I'm optimistic, but I think that there are massive risks in both of, both of those areas. Um, in our homework, we got uh, a report by an Oxford, the Oxford Martin School, which said that 45% of American jobs are going to disappear in 20 years and that this would happen in two waves. The first would attack uh, fairly low-skilled jobs in transportation and administration, and then the second wave would attack professional jobs, medicine, law, managerial jobs, and even the arts. Now, there are 3.5 million truck drivers in the US, 650,000 bus drivers, and I think it's 230,000 taxi drivers. There are some significant hurdles to be overcome before self-driving vehicles put all those people's, people out of jobs, but those hurdles are being overcome. The second wave is, is about, uh, about AI software rather than robots, obviously. It's about the process of AI becoming better and better at pattern recognition, as, uh, as AI Dario was, uh, was saying. Um, and how AI is increasingly good at taking data and turning it into information and then into, into insight. And as it gets better and better at that, the scope for a human to add value to the process declines. Being in a creative job isn't necessarily much of a defense. AI is already writing sports articles, which readers can't tell the difference between uh, an article written by an AI and an article written by a human journalist. And there's, a, uh, there's a, some musical software in Malaga here in Spain called Ayamas, which writes music which experts can't tell, uh, can't tell from human written, human written music. Why is this happening and why is it happening now? It's because we've reached a threshold in AI. AI now works. It's been around for a while and it's had its winters. I don't think there are going to be any more winters. People worry that there's too much hype now and that we'll be thrown back into a winter. I don't think that's going to happen because AI works and it is making a lot of money. As the uh, venture capital gentleman said, um, some of it's hard to see. In fact, Google is all AI. Google is an AI company. All of Google's revenue is essentially AI. And it's getting better and better at an exponential rate. Now, I suspect pretty much everybody here knows about exponentials, but it's interesting that the word hasn't been mentioned yet today. Um, so I am just going to tell the, the 30, steps, 30 steps story. Apologies if you've already heard it. If I take 30 steps one at a time from here, I'll get obviously about 30 yards, 30 meters. If I could take 30 exponential steps, so that my first step is one meter, my second step is two meters, my third step is four meters, and so on, I would get to the moon. Now, actually, I wouldn't get to the moon. I'd get to the moon in 29 steps. My 30th step would bring me all the way back. That is the power of exponential improvement, and that is what we are seeing in, in AI improvement. Now, some people think that the worries about technological unemployment are overdone, and they could point to airlines, where planes have been flying by wire for decades, and they still have human pilots on board. And <coughs> um, there is this idea that, that uh, we can be centaurs, we can race with the machines rather than racing against the machine, and we can combine with the machine. Uh, it's interesting, actually, that the human pilot only controls the plane for three minutes in an average flight because the AI is so good. But the thing is, economic efficiency always wins in the end. You might need a human pilot if, if, your, if your vehicle is uh, worth millions of dollars, it's carrying hundreds of people, and it's effectively a flying bomb. That doesn't mean you need a human attendant if you've got a taxi. So can, if, if, if the existing jobs are going, can we create lots of new jobs? Well. Our grandparents couldn't have imagined a lot of the jobs that people do today, web designers and social media marketers, uh, completely unpredictable. So perhaps our children will be emotion coaches or dream wranglers. I don't think that's very likely. 
In 2014, 90% of the 150 million or so American jobs were jobs which existed a century ago. Even if we could invent dramatic new jobs, uh, would we be able to cope up, keep up with the level of churn? We have MOOCs, we have an online education revolution, uh, but can we really all keep changing our careers every year, every six months, every month, as the AI climbs up the ladder after us? I think it is quite likely that we're heading towards a tipping point. Uh, you could call it an economic singularity. I use that word with some trepidation because of the associations of the singularity, but nevertheless. And if we get to this tipping point, which is when we have to acknowledge that a very large minority, and perhaps a majority of the population, for no fault of their own, simply are unemployable. We have to have a universal basic income. There really isn't any way around that. The hope is that these clever AI systems and robots will create an economy of radical abundance. Um, this is, what, this is the, the, the dream that Silicon Valley is selling, and let's hope they're right. Now, if we can institute, uh, if we can get to a world of radical abundance with UBI, uh, and we can avoid destroying or polluting the Earth in the process, it still leaves us with three big problems. Scarce resources, meaning, and the transition. Even if everybody can be given the living standard of a middle-class American, I know that strikes fear into some hearts, but even if everybody can, um, who gets the beachfront property with the palm trees and the white sand? Who gets the original money? We have to have some way of allocating scarce resources. How are we going to do that? Will it just be like a game of musical chairs that stopped at the point of the economic singularity and everybody stays where they are, so the rich people stay rich and the poor people stay poor? Or will we somehow have a kind of a time-sharing arrangement. Or perhaps, and I think this is more likely, there will be an elite which is still working because the machines are not AGIs at this point. They're not conscious. They don't have volition. And uh, the, the smartest people or the most ambitious people are going to be needed to direct them, to ask some questions, to guide them. And those people are probably going to obtain all the best goods and services. Now, a lot of people worry that that means we are thrown into a dystopia and that that elite will almost inevitably, and despite their own possibly best intentions, uh, abuse the rest of us. Well, maybe virtual reality, virtual reality comes to the rescue. In fact, maybe virtual reality is a necessity for an economy of radical abundance. In real life, it's simply not possible for everybody to have that beachfront property and the beautiful spouse, whereas in virtual reality, everybody can have it. The second problem after uh, allocation of scarce resources is meaning. Um, as uh, was, was said earlier, perhaps meaning is the new money. We all like to think that it would be great to retire and play golf and organize social events, but we all know people who've done that and then gone straight back to work because their lives felt meaningless without the work. Now, there are lots and lots of ways of creating meaning. It doesn't have to be through work, but for most people, certainly for many people, Work has created the meaning, and we need, need to find new ways of, of giving life meaning. And then the third big challenge is the transition. Getting from here, a, a capitalist society, to a world of, of universal basic income and radical abundance is going to be an enormous wrench. It's going to involve killing a lot of sacred cows, uh, ideological and social, and there is again the possibility that that will throw us into, into a dystopia. I don't know what the answer is, I don't know what the future scenario is going to be, and I think this, this uh, meeting, this gathering, is, is a fascinating exercise in trying to pierce through the, the veil into, into the future. My guess is it will, that what, what will happen is something that we don't expect, but in hindsight it will feel obvious. And an example of that kind of phenomenon is, is smartphones. I don't think um, that 30 years ago anybody forecast that we would have artificial intelligence in all of our pockets in the form of a telephone. I really don't think anybody thought that would happen. But in hindsight, it now seems perfectly natural, and actually, also, it seems perfectly logical. As, as Tom said, um, we are social animals. We are inherently social animals. It's because we are able to communicate that we can uh, build plans, and we can create economic surplus, and we can create technology. It's because of that, that we determine the fate of this planet and every species on it. So actually, in hindsight, it's perfectly logical that the most powerful technology that we have, artificial intelligence, has come to us in the form of a communication device. 
Now, I suspect that there is some equivalent of that uh, for uh, technological unemployment. I don't know what it is, and I, I hope we can find it.